to some of the thinking uh, or the thinking that goes on in establishing hog markets, considerations and pricing hogs uh, that it will uh, help in uh, eliminating problems related to those areas that might develop at a later time. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Okay, I give you a pretty good broad spectrum view of the situation as it relates to the packing industry. The last transparency with the uh, dead hogs on, the bottom line of that is, now we can be critical, and some of the producers in their first meeting this morning were cr critical for even showing that type of information. But the fact is, if we have someone that is abusing hogs, then ultimately that $21,000 that showed on there is going to come out of some farmer's park pocket. In all honesty, that's, that's really what happens because figuring $100 a piece, there was uh, uh, 200 and some odd hogs there, and that will figure out uh, uh, just about $2,100 there. And Wilson Foods, generally Wilson Foods has renewed their contract as of Wednesday last week. Dr. Haverkamp is a vice president uh, in charge of economics uh, and economic development of that company. So it must be something good to say about the, about the organization and the producers here. So at this time, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Haverkamp. Thank you, Alan. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, this uh, morning I had <clears throat> the pleasure of hearing <clears throat> more interesting anecdotes about the good state of Kentucky than I have heard in years, and you're going to have the privilege of hearing them, I think, if he repeats from your next speaker. But uh, what took my ear was because I'm <clears throat> virtually a native of Kentucky also. I was born and raised uh, in a little town just across the Ohio River from Rabbit Hash, Kentucky. And there were some attributes, I thought to myself, that, uh, that weren't covered completely by the speaker. I always thought of the folks down there as very deliberate, uh, as one uh, characteristic. Uh, and the best illustration I can think of is our old neighbor Sam, who one time on Saturday afternoon was out cleaning out the garage, and he came across an old pair of pants, and before throwing them away, he said, I better go through the pockets. And so he dug in the pockets, and he came out with a receipt of the type that you get when you take a pair of shoes for repair into your local cobbler. And so he looked at that receipt, and by gosh, it had a date on it indicating it was something like four years old. And he says, gee, I wonder, I don't remember those shoes. I wonder what'll happen if I take them in. So he went into rabbit hash, and he threw it down on the desk, and <clears throat> the cobbler picked it up and said, hmm. And he went in the back room, and he came back and he says, yeah, <clears throat> they're here. Be ready a week from Wednesday. <laughs> Does that sound like Kentucky? <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> we've got quite a sizable little chore. We probably are covering too much ground, but uh, we'll try and go through it as rapidly as possible. As Alan told you, we want to try and cover three different topics. And the first one deals with hog cutout values and value differences among grades. And the first one you uh, can't hardly see at all, 
uh, even as I had brightened it there. See, that helps a lot. If you could get one more bank of lights in the very back, it might help. But the title <clears throat> there deals with the cutout values and the listing from top to bottom are all of the cuts that contribute to the value of a hog that you market. This happens to be a 240-pound hog. And <clears throat> what we're going to do now, in each of the subsequent four slides, I'm going to pull out a section right from the top. First two uh, cuts you notice there are hams and loins, OK? We're going to show those and then go on clear down to the bottom, but we'll do it in four consecutive slides if this works right. Uh, on this first one, we do have the hams and loins, and the first column shows the weight of the cut, then the second column, the yield as a percent of a live weight, and the market price per hundred weight, and all these prices were, I took as of, I think it was the 15th of November. Wouldn't make any particular difference in, except, uh, as far as affecting the relative value. Then the cutout value per live hundred weight. The total dollars, 506, means that of all of the hams <clears throat> that w uh, w drop in the category of 17 to 20, that's what they contribute. And then also you get uh, even more 20 to 26s. But when you get all through, the right, clear on the right-hand side, do you see that last number, 30.5? That means that the total value uh, contributed by the ham to the total value of the hog is 30 and a half percent. In other words, hams account for 30 and a half percent of the total value. That sounds maybe elementary, but it's <clears throat> daggone important, particularly it gets impressive when you combine it with the loins. And there you have uh, the comparable figure is 24.3. And unless my arithmetic is wrong, in just those two cuts, you have over half of the value of the hog accounted for. Those are terribly important. Well, running ahead to the rest of the, uh, the uh, primal cuts, the picnic, 7.1% there. I'm looking on the extreme right-hand column. And the Boston butt, 7.5. So the shoulder there makes up about, accounts for about 15% of the total. Bellies, 14%. <coughs> Spare ribs, 4.7. Maybe that doesn't sound so much, but if you look back to that yield column, the second column, where well, you see that uh, it really is only about 2.5% of live weight. And so, but it is, is contributing four and a half, four, nearly 5% to the total value. So that indicates what's a, a high price. 94 cents for the three and downs means it's a popular cut in great demand. Then we go to the rest of the carcass, the regular trimmings, special trimmings, neck bone skins, all of them put together. The only one there that is, uh, well, all of them have a value per hundred weight. You notice that is less than the live weight of the hog, except for the special trimmings, which are 79.20, high priced. <clears throat> Take those out, though, and you have a total value that these so-called minor cuts are contributing that comes up to over $2. So uh, it's an important area. And the last one, <clears throat> where we also have the items that are basically come off on the kill floor, uh, starting with the uh, off all the meat specialties, a <clears throat> very important area. There's a long list of them. Each one by themselves uh, sound pretty minor, but yet some of them are pretty dramatic. Uh, in the from the pancreatic gland, for example, we get the uh, it provides the raw material for the insulin for uh, for um, diabetes and uh, four little ounces in each hog, but uh, it contributes even to the value to the extent here on the cutting floor basis of about 10 cents per live hundred weight. 10 cents comes is part of that $1.55. Then the kill lard, the kill and cut, you 
add those items together and you have uh, obviously well over uh, two or two and a half dollars just from this area separate and apart from the carcass. Anyway, it adds up to a grand total of 5209 as of that date. And I just thought it would be interesting to you since I don't think you have a chance to see numbers of this type every day that uh, uh, just how the buildup takes place. In other words, every one of those items you saw there is making its own little or big contribution, whatever the case may be, all the way from the ham to the, to the off-all item and so forth. But it all taken together brings about that 5209. And as that value, gauged by, governed by supply and demand each day, as that value, cutout value changes, why then we've got to, and we do uh, through forces of competition, reflect that into the live hog. When these values go up, live hog prices go up. When they go down, the live hog prices are going down. So uh, there's a very direct connection uh, between the two. Moving on from this area, we want to uh, get closer to the grades now and uh, what they, uh, some of our thoughts and judgments about those that may be of interest to you. <clears throat> I had just a, a note or two about this particular table that I wanted to read. Uh, On the, uh, well, there are two points that I'd like to make about it. You see on the left-hand side, you have back fat in inches going from very lean, 1.0 and under, down to the bottom, very fat, 2.2 inches and over. And then the three columns are the light hogs, 200, 220, and two, two, I think it's two, can't see it from here, 220 to 230, 240 to 250. And so basically, as uh, you already know, most of you know, uh, this table confirms for us that the lighter weight hogs on the average have less back fat than the hogs of heavier weight. But secondly, this table also tells us that within a given weight range, such as 240 to 250, that's the one on the extreme right, a significant number of hogs are coming to market that have a back fat as little, little as 1.3 inches or less, but we also have quite a sizable percentage of the total hogs marketed that fall above 1.8 inches. In other words, there's a fairly wide range in the degree of fatness or leanness of hogs being marketed, at least based upon our experience, and we have no idea what a table looks like that for any of our competitors. That's our own data, our own experience. But let us <clears throat> look at the bright side. I think it's a bright side for just a moment longer. Those 240 pound hogs with 1.3 inches or less of back fat. So if you add those numbers together, right there at the top, you get 13% uh, uh, or so that we can say of all those 240 pound hogs fell in this category. Now if you c include also the 1.4 inch hogs, we get well over 20% of the total marketings. In other words, over 20% of the hogs marketed in that weight group have less than 1 1.4 inches of back fat. To us, this is uh, impressive in that it shows that a significant number of producers have already developed the kind of hog that is capable of staying lean up to 240 pound, 45 pounds live weight. We would suspect that this weight and grade of hogs are the most profitable being produced today, all factors considered. Data <clears throat> that's been analyzed at Purdue shows that hogs with 1.3 inches of back fat do require less feed per pound of gain than those with more than 1.3 inches. And despite the prevailing discount, on the heavier weight cuts that we note, noted before, this can probably be offset when comparing a really lean 245 pound butcher with a fat 210 pounder. Probably we should note here, 
in viewing this uh, graphic description of a Wilson number two grade hog that our that by our I mean our company's uh, objective and philosophy for many years has been that of maintaining our so-called average grade specifications right in the middle of the full quality range of all hogs actually marketed and the width of this number two band which you see on the screen is purposely geared to include about 35 to 40 percent of all hogs of each given weight as you'd read the, give, the weight off of the horizontal scale that's weight light, light on the left and going toward heavier and heavier weight that's what that scale is about so that procedure then would divide the remaining 60 percent of the hogs equally in the two parts in other words about 30 percent of the hogs by our grading system would be falling into the number one or zero grades lean category and then we have the 35 or 40 that would be fall in the average or number two and then another 30 percent in the number three uh, fat or over fat category now our concept is in contrast with the way that USDA has set up their standards and they are geared to reflect the same kind of lean cut yield within a given grade regardless of the relative supply of each grade of hogs within each given weight group but let me put it another way USDA specifications have not been changed for over 10 years while Wilson's have been modified periodically to remain in harmony with the shift toward leaner hogs in the total population marketed now in viewing this slide we might conclude that there are really no drastic differences between the two grade definitions yet let me give you an example or two of the differences that do clearly show up and if you were close enough to the screen you could see these for instance in the 200 to 210 weight range hogs with as much as 1.6 inches of back fat would be a US number two <clears throat> but under the USDA grades but would not make the Wilson number two grade but if then if you go up to the 250 to 260 weight range it's clear that uh, say at 1.5 inches of back fat it would be better than a Wilson number two but it would still be a US number two so in short it's much easier for a hog to become a Wilson number one than a US number one when he gets into and above the 230 to 240 pound weight bracket now in this slide we see that the USDA grading system that was classifying about 10% uh, reading off the first line about 10% of all butcher hog marketings as lean back in 1968 now has about 31% falling into this category at the other extreme down at the bottom you see that 12% of hogs fell into the overfat category in 1968 but this has now dropped to 2% which I would think of as virtually a non-working grade it isn't doing anything anymore whether any of these numbers surprise you obviously depends upon your uh, previous impressions until we reviewed the data we had uh, personally expected a larger increase in the US number one grade over the past 10 years uh, informed animal scientists some that I've talked to at least think that an attainable level of lean hogs should be at least 50 to 60 percent of total marketings uh, in terms of the USDA grade standards so we have not reached that particular target and that would imply that we still have more work to do um, as mentioned earlier it does cost less to produce a lean hog so this is one reason in itself for pushing um, in that direction but what's the size of the price differentials among grades and shown here in the lower half of the table are two different sets of differentials and they are different 
The USDA estimates, the same type that its market news service publishes daily and weekly, indicated as of November 15th, as I remember, indicated a $2 difference per carcass hundredweight for adjoining grades are as much as $1.40 on a live basis. Our own Wilson test results indicated, as shown here, a materially narrower differential. I think two points can be made. First, we know that our own detailed cutting tests were conducted with much care, and we do have confidence in them. Second, we know that the USDA tests <clears throat> were run over 10 years ago, and we know that they, they've told us that they are in process of analyzing new data, and perhaps their new research will resolve the discrepancies. As best I know that they, they hope to uh, get something published on it before the year, before sometime during 1979. Parenthetically, you might be puzzled by the top half of the slide showing USDA computed values of the six primal cuts and which are much lower than the Wilson values. And this simply comes about because uh, USDA primal cut yields of 10 years ago, in effect, are used in calculating their value differentials between grades, and those yields, of course, are sharply below those actually being realized in the industry today. And so that's the reason why those, are, those calculations come out as low as they do. Uh, perhaps uh, this slide here provides the quickest way to uh, a better understanding of how values between grades can differ a great deal. Uh, it, yeah, it's in, I want to be sure, this deals with the pork loin by itself. We've taken the, pulled the pork loin out, it's, we're looking at putting a microscope on that one cut. And if you look somewhere in the middle of that table, if you focus on that table, you will see that according to the USDA cuts, tests, I should say, they found a reduction of 1.09% of live weight in going from the loins out of number two hogs to the loins from number three uh, animals. Now this amounts to a difference of 2.0 pounds in loin weight and it meant a difference, means a difference of 70 cents per hundredweight. Now in contrast, and this is where the difference comes in, you see, in contrast based upon all the tests that we have run, we could find a difference between these two grades of only 1.5 pounds and are the equivalent of about 34 cents per live hundredweight. And so that's the basic reason, I would say, and putting it in very real terms, why we have this kind of difference showing up in the size of the differential. Uh, some may say we have used too much time here to talk about uh, essentially conflicting data, but we wanted to share with you the fact that there currently is not uh, all that full agreement on the size of these value differences. And testing in this area has to be done with great, great care. It's not easy. And uh, we got to be careful not to be unduly critical. Uh, but there are prospects, I think, of resolving these differences depending on how USDA's new analysis proceeds. Now, our last slide on the cutout value and grading segment is shown here on the screen, and uh, we're almost tempted to apologize for its simplicity, but it's intended only to bring out the point that value per live uh, hundredweight is greatly changed by a dressed yield difference of some 3%, which is not all that unusual to find. Of course, variation in farm handling and weighing conditions are all important as an influence on dressing percent, and this ties in with our experience of being unable to uncover any substantial correlation between dressing percentage and grade or back fat thickness among lots of hogs. Moving on to our second facet of the hog business, we want to review for a, a few developments surrounding the pork export market, try to look at it uh, 
in a uh, in an object fully an objective way yet in a critical way and see what train uh, changing trends we can uncover as shown on the first line our total pork exports over the past 10 years have trended upward but progress has been fairly slow and particularly when you think about 1978, we've been, we're running for the first nine or ten months of this year some 25 percent below a year earlier. So uh, when we get the record in for the full year, why the total shipments may not be much more than 300 million pounds. Also as shown here, Canada and Japan have for a long time been our leading customers and exports to uh, both of those countries will be lower this year as part of the overall total that trend downward that I mentioned for the year as a whole. Uh, Canadian hog production is now expanding and uh, it leaves our prices uh, too high at times to be uh, fully competitive. Japan is more of a unique situation, important, very important country uh, from the standpoint of overall agricultural uh, purchases of agricultural products. Pork consumption in that country has uh, shown material growth in recent years, averaging about 5% per year. But believe it or not, the, that expansion has come through increased Japanese hog production that uh, the next speaker will be telling you a little more about, and not through imports. So despite the confines of the small island and the tiny relatively, they must be relatively tiny hog operations there that can't hardly be of outstanding efficiency, depending on, I suppose, how you measure efficiency, not in terms of labor efficiency, but the Japanese government continues to protect and encourage these small units, uh, production units, by keeping tight quotas on meat imports and at the same time encouraging expanded imports of grain and oil seeds for their uh, growing hog and poultry industries. For that matter, the story of a subsidized livestock industry can be repeated for a number of other countries uh, throughout both Western and Eastern Europe, with most of these countries driving very hard to provide larger meat supplies for their people, they've been going the route of expanding their grain and oil seed purchases and growing their own livestock rather than imp uh, import the meat and meat products. As shown here, all red meat exports combined last year, last year were less than $400 uh, million, uh, are only a fraction of our exports of nearly $10 billion of feed grains and soybeans in 77. Now, in one sense, it might be said that the main feed grain importing countries uh, do respect the superior efficiency of our corn producers. They're certainly willing to buy our feed grain instead of producing it themselves, but they don't as yet have the same attitude toward our hog and pork industry talents, whether it be producer and packer or combination thereof, since they've been largely choosing to produce the hog and slaughter the hogs and produce the pork themselves. And because of this urge to produce their own meat, foreign countries bought 1,950,000,000 bushels of corn, corn only, from the U.S. this past year, which is more than three times the 600 million bushels that they imported just 10 years ago. So with this huge export expansion, as shown here, feed usage for our own livestock and poultry industry has, ha <coughs> has ha not had the uh, chance to expand, but very little. The last line summarizes the story for the decade with uh, our own feed usage going up an average of only about one half percent per year, while exports uh, jumped by 21 percent per year, which is a tremendous increase. In short, the record shows I think that it's difficult to expand grain exports by leaps and bounds and at the same time produce enough pork to be price competitive in world markets.
Granted, this situation could, can change uh, if and when countries like Japan take a hard look at the, ec at the economics of transporting six or seven pounds of grain from here to Japan versus the cost of shipping an equivalent pound of boneless pork loin. In other words, to break it into two parts, uh, if it costs, uh, if you've got to feed four pounds of grain over in, um, in Japan to get a pound of bone-in pork loin, and then you talk about a 60% yield from bone-in to boneless, why you're really talking about six or seven pounds of grain um, in uh, shipping one, shipping that versus shipping one pound of boneless pork loin. So unless the Japanese are much more efficient in producing and slaughtering a hog than we are, I think they may find that paying large subsidies to their livestock producers is not the most economical way to feed their people. In any event, as this slide documents, the past five years has seen material expansion in hog consumption in practically all of the foreign countries in which we have sold sizable quantities of feed grains, and of course this correlation is not just happenstance. <clears throat> Their pork consumption expanded, and it was, and it was able to expand, it did expand only because uh, of uh, the feed grain that we were providing. <clears throat> this uh, slide on expenditures of promotional funds for U.S. exports, I think, does provide our meat people with a definite ray of hope. <clears throat> uh, the U.S. The Meat Export Federation was formed only a few years ago, and it now provides the nucleus or framework for a significant promotional effort and uh, with an estimated $1.4 million available from all sources for this important work. Um, granted, the feed grain and oilseed people will still be spending some 10 times this amount, but at least we in the meat business have made a start. In a real sense, there's no reason at all for the feed grain folks to become concerned about our own modest promotional efforts. They, I think, should keep in mind, must keep in mind, that each pound of meat exported will create a demand for grain from our own livestock industry that will be just as effective as the demands from a foreign livestock industry. We turn now to our third and last topic, namely vertical integration, difficult one to talk about. I think it's important to take just a moment at the beginning and define a couple of terms uh, because um, terms are used in several different ways. We personally like to use a rather strict definition of vertical integration itself, including only those situations where the integrator exercises clear-cut control over both production and processing operations. Under this definition, we would presently classify essentially all of the broiler industry as being vertically integrated, whereas the hog and pork sector still has little or no vertical integration to our knowledge. Probably most of the confusion occurs, where most of it occurs, is for some folks to include all informal and formal contractual arrangements under the integration heading. I think some of these types have been in existence for a long time, such as uh, uh, hog producers' agreements with his feed supplier or his banker or even with his marketing agent. But to us, such contractual arrangements belong under the heading of vertical coordination. Underscore that, if you will, please. Vertical coordination. They're usually mu mutually beneficial. They improve efficiency of the system, but they do not involve complete shift of ownership or control of the operation, as is required in vertical integration. Now, by this time, you've absorbed the contents of the slide on the screen, and maybe you have noted that we have projected the production from the integrated poultry industry to exceed pork output in 1979. Now, I think it's worth noting,
because it will be the first time, to my knowledge, in recorded history that this has happened. Um, this has to be a little bit sobering for us, but the, the broilers have been persistently pushing their way into an ever larger share of the retail meat case, and this growth rate <clears throat> has come about mainly because of one thing, a persistent and a intensive effort by broader integrators to cut costs at every conceivable opportunity. I think of cost cutting for them as almost a crusade or a religion. And there are some of us who do not think that similar sizable profits from vertic vertical integration exist in the hog sector. But I must concede there's at least one man down in Arkansas, Don Tyson by name, who has recently launched a major effort to prove we're wrong. We understand his target is some 30,000 sows capable of providing one half million market hogs per year. This would be large enough, and that's the reason I think for the size he is targeting, this would be large enough to support a small hog, uh, pork slaughtering plant, and if and when he builds it, he will be, by our definition, a full-fledged vertical integrator in the hog business, paralleling the kind of broiler op uh, integration that he already successfully operates. But the more important question is whether others will be following, following in Don's footsteps. Uh, here are two quick observations. First, a production operation large enough to support at least a fairly efficient packing plant um, and the, all the hogs to go with it does require millions of dollars of capital, which probably means that only the larger publicly held companies would be financially capable of moving in this direction. Second point, though, is that such companies are ordinarily want stable quarter-to-quarter -quarter earnings in order to keep their stockholders happy. And that's the reason, basically, why firms, a number of firms, such as uh, mm, Pillsbury, such as uh, Ralston Perina, others have gone out of uh, the broiler business because they didn't like the erratic pattern of earnings. And uh, up to this point, at least, the hog business <coughs> has uh, not been known for hardly for its high stability of earnings. So our conclusion is there might be very few firms that will follow Mr. Tyson's pioneering efforts uh, simply because they don't have either his expertise with integrated operations nor his unconcern about mm, patterns of erratic earnings. Well, whether you agree or not with this appraisal, one thing is certain. Don is, Tyson is providing us with a ringside seat at one of the most interesting uh, ventures that the hog industry has seen in a long time. While integration provided a means of cutting costs that could be achieved in no other way, uh, the same thing cannot be said for the hog business. Uh, uh, a hog producer can take most potential cost-cutting steps through his own efforts, in our judgment, without having any outside disciplines imposed on him. For instance, this slide shows clearly the shift that has been taking place in the size of hog operations in Iowa over the past five years. I'm showing just two lines there, 1972 and 1977, um, as of the end of 77. And uh, in the column on the right has those producers who marketed over 1,000 head per year. And we say, see that over that five-year period, the number of producers has gone up some 73, 74 percent. And so my point here would be again that these men who are falling, who are moving in that direction with respect to size, I think are obviously uh, capturing these e economies of size, these efficiencies, and uh, they are not requiring uh, integration as I've defined it. Uh, to achieve that particular goal. Likewise, I might, we might take a moment to look at 
the number of hogs represented by those uh, different producer sizes. And here again, we see that when we look at the larger operations, that the number has doubled over the past five years and now accounts for about 30% of all of Iowa hogs marketed. At the other end of the scale, nearly one-third of all producers selling under 350 head back in 1972 have since done one of two things. They either got somewhat bigger or they left the hog business. Overall, we know, uh, we think it fair to conclude that these changes have pushed more efficiency into the hog business and related to our basic points, these improvements, again, have been made by the independent producer without help from an integrated partner. This next slide, very simple one, on pig save per litter uh, over the past 20 years has just a twofold purpose. First, it highlights, I think, one of our real problems in the production side of the industry, but also one that represents a major opportunity for improved efficiency. Some animal scientists are convinced that a fully attainable goal for a good commercial producer should be nine to 10 pigs saved per litter. And if we buy that number, then there's obviously a great opportunity here to cut production costs. But our second point is that this marks still another area where material improvement does not have to wait on vertical integration by any means. The independent operator, I think, is basically capable of licking most problems of this kind. Turning now for a moment from the producer to the packer, we see here a simple map showing the location by states of the 146 largest hog slaughtering plants in the country. Actually, there are about 1,200 thousand more than what's shown here that slaughter under federal inspection, but they are, of course, smaller than the plants we're showing here. Relating this map to the integration question, there is a prevailing school of thought um, in USDA which says there are not enough hog slaughtering plants in the country and that we need more in order to provide more packer competition in all local market areas. And one of their proposed solutions is to organize cooperatives wherever uh, hog producers could become vertically integrated with a newly built or purchased packing plant. Of course, this should theoretically provide producers with some protection uh, in the short run from an absence of adequate competition if that is known to be a serious problem. However, what we have actually had in our industry during in our slaughtering end of the industry during the past few years, say particularly from 1972 to 77, into this year, has been a financial bloodbath, which is pretty good uh, evidence that I think that we've had an excess of slaughter capacity and too many plants in the industry rather than just too, rather than too few. Here are just a few, uh, couple of uh, several other numbers which show the concentration of hog slaughter for the four largest firms uh, in the case of the three different species. And uh, as you see in the, for the hogs, uh, the number, the slaughter by the larger firms has been gradually declining over the past 20 years. And this percentage is not large when you compare it with um, the industrial field, any place, almost any place in the industry you go, the four largest firms account for on the order of 50 to 60 percent of total industry output. Uh, one further point regarding concerning presence or absence of uh, adequate competition relates to the number of buying stations and terminals. And those that are listed on this slide shows, oh, for example, Iowa is the largest with, uh, as stated, with a est number estimated by USDA in this case of 630 or over six per county. I think this relates to the question of competition in that while a packer may be located a sizable distance from a given area, he certainly does have access to dealers of this type from whom he can buy 
on short notice if and when prices become relatively depressed. So the theory, to conclude this area, the, con the theory that addition of more plants will tend to raise prices in some localities I think may sound good at first blush, but you can easily end up with plants having so much excess capacity that they go bankrupt and then such plants don't help anyone. Perhaps the shortest way of stating our problem in the uh, slaughtering industry in recent years